The following podcast may contain some strong language and adult themes. If you've got young children around, maybe save it until they've gone to bed. If you really don't like bad words, this pod probably isn't for you. Welcome to the Making Up the Numbers podcast. The Making Up the Numbers podcast is sponsored by Hope Technology, JTEC Suspension, Revolution Bike Park, Ride Southern Spain, Schwalb, from the world's finest independent mountain bike magazine, Single Track. Previously on the Making Up the Numbers podcast. I was so frustrated. Yeah. Like, I remember I just wanted to go straight home to the gym and lift, <laughs> drop heavy weights. I've never actually experienced frustration like it and anger. I was, that's probably the angriest I've been after a bike race because all I knew, I was told before, all I had to do was enter better and I would have got the overall. Yeah. And you tripped it in the bushes. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking going out the staircase, but. I just was trying to break every turn on the track. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I've seen the crash video and I remember thinking, oh, yeah. what, what was he doing here? He has come 10. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't make the turn. I just went straight over it. Red Bull made it out to be battle of the Titans. Like there was a lot of tension, um, but I feel like we've both been through so much that I just felt like I was like, whatever, it's all water under the bridge. Like I couldn't care less anymore. Like what she achieved that weekend was amazing was incredible and I knew she was capable of doing it and I was very excited to see her race but not only that from a selfish point of view I was so happy I felt like I was missing part of me it's like Harry Potter and Voldemort like I was just like I felt like I, I, like, I felt lost without her like it's, it's true I was like I just I didn't have the same motivation when I was racing Rachel I was so fired up I come through the finish and then obviously just got myself out of there because I was pissed off and Aaron Gwynn stopped me in this little tunnel that we had to go through to get out and I was like I remember thinking I, obviously I was annoyed I didn't want to see anyone and I remember thinking why is Gwynny stopping me like and he was like are you alright mate you all? I was like yeah I'm fine he was like you were on one and I was like <laughs> was I? because obviously I don't know anything I didn't even look around like yeah you've just got out of there yeah. he went yeah he went you were green and I was like <laughs> he made it worse I was like are you fucking searing so I just went back to our little um, pit at the bottom of the chairlift and I just sat there on my own just cried and anything just sat there staring into space for about 20 minutes um, processing it so but that's racing and that's why we love it I guess Hello and welcome to episode 9 of season 5 it might be getting cold here in the northern hemisphere but this ep- episode will definitely be bringing the heat first up we have possibly the biggest hashtag team rumour of all time, definitely since Gwyn to YT in late 2015. Then we'll be, p- be playing Retirement 20 Questions with Jack before the Austrian World Cup winner, Andy Cole, makes his debut on the show. And we're very excited about that. Right, let's get cracking. Jack, Emmy, how are you doing? Cold. Very fucking cold. <laughs> I've just been, been across it and it was literally like double coats before we started. And I'm not even sure if I was warm by the end. Very cold. Emmy? Yeah, it's it, it's quite cold here as well, but he just snowed a lot and I ventured out with the car this morning. It was quite the adventure. And now it's raining on top of it, so it's definitely miserable now. Ain't it funny though? Like today we got up and there was have you got snow over there, George? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we've got a little bit here, not much, but a little bit. It's actually more or less melted now, but this morning when I went out in the snow with Blake and Albus, it was nice. It was cold, but I was all right. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I went out in five degrees warmer in the rain, I'd be freezing. I'd be like, I'd be like shivering. Isn't it funny how like different weather? Because the sun was out and it was crisp. I didn't mind that. Whereas mm. it's wet and miserable and grey. You're like, ugh. See, I went out in it before that. I had to. Have, I agreed to have my van in the garage for its MOT at half seven this morning, and I had oh, to e-b- e-bike back from the next village along. Oh, and it was just getting yeah. light, and it was pretty cold. Yeah, I bet. I forgot my balaclava as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jack, we had our first coaching session a few weeks back, and I think you saw a lot of potential in me. I mean, 
I mean, what you actually said was that there's a lot to work on, but I've tried to take <laughs> the positives out of it. <laughs> yeah, mate, absolutely. Like, you're you're uh, genuinely, in, genuinely in quite a nice position because you've got loads of things there that you can, if you put your mind to it, and obviously I've given you the feedback and the list of things to be cracking on with over the next few months, you're going to see hopefully some some decent improvements. Whereas <clears throat> some people come to me and there's very few things I can be like, right, over the next couple of months, you'll improve this, this, and this. We're more looking for finer details. So yeah, man, relish the opportunity. Like I, I'd like to think that by March you'll be, uh, You'll be getting some of those goals done. Get I've been out. Goal. I've been out every weekend since. I've, I've been seen. practicing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been trying. Yeah, trying to hold that body position and stuff. Yeah. So you've been busy since then. You've been out in Portugal. Tell tell us a bit about it. Yeah, um, it kind of generated more questions than it answered. Um, I would, I'd initially advertised one of our kind of new holiday camps for November, but. I didn't really do much advertising. It didn't, we didn't get enough people interested. So I was like, well, actually, that's a little bit of a blessing in disguise because I do need to go and do some work ahead of the camps next year. So we went to check the track out. That had been kind of badly damaged by the rain. None of the Portuguese do any track maintenance whatsoever. It's not a thing over there. So all the bushes had grown back. So we had to kind of spend two days getting the track going again, which is we've realized that we need to get in there really with diggers. So that's now an extra trip in January where we're going to have a kind of bit of a team crew over there and some of Mark's dig crew, two diggers on a track to really kind of not just improve things for the camps next year, but give the track some longevity so that when we actually return to it each time, it's it's it will be open and running because the top section that had had the proper work done to it last January was absolutely fine when we went last week, whereas everything else was like bushed over. And so there was that. I wanted to look to see whether I was ready to buy my own vehicle in Portugal yet. Vehicles in Portugal are super expensive. The one we went and looked at was 8K for this absolute wreck of a thing. <laughs> Honestly, the number of things wrong with it was insane. And uh, <laughs> the, the guy, the mechanic said, oh yeah, you buy it and then we take, then we fix it. And I was like, no. Um, there were so many things wrong with it. So we basically decided, well, that's not an option at the moment with the budget we got. So that means I've got to take another vehicle from here. We're looking at properties over there. And then I met one of our new riders. We did some of that, um, got together with him, which is exciting. So yeah, it was a good week. It was a busy week, but, um, yeah, it was good. Cool. And the team's taking shape for 2024. Yeah, it, it is. Um, we've got, we've got a new sponsor, um, for frames. We've got a couple of new other sponsors and, Honestly, given the situation of the industry right now um, and the fact I've just retired from World Cups, it's I'm really, really pleased with the situation we're in. And we're going to be, you know, we're, we're going to be a 10 rider program next year, including myself covering youth, junior. Wow. So, yeah, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, we're, a, we're going to be a, the factory team for the brand we're going to be working with. Obviously, we're still working with SR Sunto. So, yeah, I've had uh, three or four weeks on the bike now. I was on the bike in Portugal, which is why I wasn't sharing any content while I was there because obviously I was on a, a test in a different frame. So, so yeah, um, th things are great and uh, the future for the team's looking really good. So, pleased. Excellent. So, Emmy, we're recording the intro of this show this afternoon and you're flying out to Brazil this evening. So, you, you can't do the interview with Andy, but tell us a bit about that trip. Yeah, it's, it's a vacation, more nice. or less, I'd say. Because, yeah, and um, Jack will know about this. Like during the season, now the season's going until October, you don't really get vacations at all yeah. in nice and weather. And uh, Cam was obviously in a bad way. So I was more at home and we didn't get to go somewhere nice. And she still had that flight from the Snowshoe and um, Mountain and woke up. That was still, um, yeah, there and we couldn't refund it. So it, changed it into Brazil and I'm actually excited because I'm going to be we're going to be visiting a friend of mine who who was riding World Cups and four cross World Cups back in maybe 10 years ago right. um Luana Oliveira maybe Jack remembers but she's a like crazy Brazilian girl that was really good at four cross and like kind of break through maybe 10 years back and now she's living in Brazil there so cool we're going to stay at hers and enjoy probably train a little bit but we don't take bikes with so we're gonna we're just gonna yeah it's a good timing from the weather <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and how's cami doing now good good we she had her last um she's so a shoulder specialist like for her, all the chest pain uh i think it was yesterday yeah and he said oh yeah so from the shoulder is um 
everything's fine. So the pain she's experiencing is not coming from the shoulder, it's coming from the chest and she needs to see a chest specialist. But he, he said, oh yeah, because you had ribs broken. And we were like, oh, did, did she? Because <laughs> nobody <laughs> kind of noticed. Obviously, he focused on the brain yeah. and the collarbone, which wasn't damaged, but the pain was in the collarbone, but apparently she had broken ribs. So um, she needs to see a chest specialist because to see if there's some some kind of blockage under the collarbone that's like, and also blockage of some kind of like blood vessels. So that's why when she's actually doing exercise, it comes worse than when she's actually like standing there. Okay. So it might resolve itself on its own, but it might be like some kind of stuff that a surgeon could be with a quick like um, surgery could really fix it. So we need to see that guy and see what he says, but that actually it's an explanation for the pain that was like unexplained. So pretty good, but not really good at the same time because there's yeah. something that's not totally right there. Cool. And what have you been up to? Anything exciting in the last few weeks? Mm, not really. <laughs> Working <laughs> at school. I had two weeks at kindergarten and I usually don't do kindergarten. And it was a bloody nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it was a baby sitting the whole day. No, it was, it was, um, you, know, you, get, you get to work at some point. But um, yeah, some did a bit of that. We did a little bit of riding before the weather got really bad. And now I'm ready to go to Brazil. So yeah, usual life. Excellent. So. The plan for this show was it's all a bit quiet on the news front. There's no big rumours. We've not heard anything else about next season. So this would be a really good opportunity to do Jack's retirement 20 questions and then bring Andy in. All good. So that's what we were doing. And then boom, probably the biggest team rumour ever breaks this week. And we're now on Thursday and I still haven't seen it on any public forums. So the rumour we're hearing is that the GOAT, Greg Minar, will be saying goodbye to the Santa Cruz Syndicate a team he's been riding for for the last 16 seasons, where he's delivered a staggering 17 World Cup wins and three World Championships. And what we're hearing is that he'll be lining up for Norco in 2024. As I said, this is just a rumour, but we've tried to clarify it. And in doing so, I've had the same information from, th is it three now unconnected sources, Emmy? I'm on yep. two, you're on one. Uh, and I've, I've reached out to Greg for comment, but I haven't heard anything back as yet. I, I wouldn't expect to hear anything because he'll probably still be under contract with Santa Cruz until the end of the year and probably can't comment. In fact, the only thing that makes me doubt this rumour is that when I saw Greg in Fort William earlier in this year, I'm sure he told me he signed with Santa Cruz for five years. But if it's true, that's a huge gamble for Pon, isn't it? Especially given that Santa Cruz have just launched the new V10. Thoughts? Well, when you first told me, I said, didn't I? I was like, fuck off. I was like, <clears throat> if that's true, <laughs> the industry really has gone, not the industry, the world's gone mad. Because <clears throat> I think everybody thought that Greg would wrap up his career at the syndicate. And yeah. from both sides, I don't think anybody thought that that would, you know, he'd finish there and then move on somewhere else and have his twilight years on a different brand that just Greg Minar, Santa Cruz Syndicate, they just come as one, don't they? So firstly, to hear him leaving, I was like, Nah, if he's leaving, he's retiring, surely. But then, no disrespect to Norco here, but so then here he's going to Norco. Like, what? They're not known <laughs> as having, like, you know, the big riders and the, the you know, I hope everybody knows what I mean now. It's Greg Minar, for fuck's sake. Like, that's a huge, huge thing. And if he was leaving Syndicate, you would have thought he'd be going to, you know, Specialized Gravity or, you know, one of the huge, like, setups. So, it's interesting to hear that a team that we got told was folding at the start of the 2023 season yeah. came back and had a team, which has been quite small and quite quiet, is now signing Greg Manal. I was like, what the fuck? So, yeah, they're my thoughts. I think, do you wow. Not, do you not think, though, that it might be, if they're building a new bike, because um, Gracie was a, and Mark were on, were on and Lucas were on a new bike the second half of mm -hmm. the season, I think it was, he might be the perfect person to help develop that? Oh, yeah, it's real smart. I'm just really surprised. Yeah. Like, uh, Emmy? Yeah, I mean, I remember when was it? I thought the same. I thought, oh, like, oh, maybe, I don't know if Norco is going to be a thing, like, at all. And also because um, on, like, the more um, ambassadorship side, Jill yeah. and Bryn also dropped by Norco. I remember Jill putting his resume yeah. online, and I was like, oh, that's not a good sign. But maybe now yeah. everything made sense, maybe, because if they're signing such a big, other rider then they might have to yeah. get the budget somewhere but obviously that's a huge news and 
I don't know, like they develop in the bike also. We cook my dough well, and he's like a really good person to work with. So maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So um, off the yeah. back of this, I'm not sure how connected these things are. And again, these are rumors, but I've heard Laurie's re-signed with the syndicate for another two years and that Mark Wallace has been let go by Norco, which does make sense if Greg's coming in, I suppose. But real shame if it's true because Mark's a fantastic rider and I thought it was a great fit with their brand, you know, with him being Canadian. Yep. Greg Minar, Lucas Cruz and Gracie Hemstreet. It's quite a good, strong team though, isn't it? Yeah, you would, yeah, you would think so. And like you said, George, like they are trying to really develop the bike. You know, who better to have in there than, than Renard, so. Yeah. Greg's obviously been synonymous with the V10. It'd be interesting to see how he gets on with a different bike and especially the, the high pivot. How the very top riders, we don't see them change bike that often. Yeah. How long does it take to adapt to a different type of bike, do you reckon? I don't think it takes very long, to be honest. Like, obviously, I've just gone through that process myself in the last three weeks and it, some days I've ridden both the V10 and the new frame and, other days I've just ridden a new frame and I've now been back to a track in Portugal that I know extremely well. I probably did 75 to 100 laps of it in the pre-season when I was coaching and training myself and within two days was matching my times from the start of the year. Um, the setup's a little different. I needed to do slightly different things with the shock to get the same kind of performance. But ultimately, like I think a lot of it's more the rider than the bike. Everyone's making really good bikes nowadays. and Yeah. You just need to ride the thing, get it set up, and then usually I think you're off. I think it's more so like, I think it's even worse if you change sometimes little things like suspension, Ooh, brakes. Yeah. Like, it makes it even, I think it makes it harder. For example, I see Bernard with the prototype. Obviously, the prototype is a more modern bike. So obviously, it was straight away faster on, on the prototype, but it was hard because obviously, it's Muller, it's like a high pivot. And all these things. So he was just coming fast into section and then we'll hop on the old bike and it was just, <laughs> it's just as fast, but it just does, doesn't break as well. So you just crash on the braking point, you know? So there's like yeah. little things like this. Yeah. But if you keep your tires, you keep your brakes. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was thinking, what is he going to do with suspension? That was like my book, my big thought. I mean, now on the Brockshock suspension. Yeah. Like, that point. Now it's just like, this is, this is worrying me the most. The frame must be like, yeah, really good, does it, but does it it's mean a big Norco, change. Yeah. Does it mean Norco can get Fox? Like, could be. Like, it's a fair, really fair point you just made though. And like, I think I'd rather change frame than grips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I've been running the same grips now for a good few years. Mm -hmm. I really like them. And if you had to make me go on to like a different grip that was a totally yeah. different style. That's the contact point with the bike. So it's a really fair point there. I mean, the small things can actually be like pedals as well. If you took me off Crank Brothers and put me on a Shimano, I'd be fuming for weeks. Like I drag, I drag, <laughs> I, if I own clip, I drag back into my cleat. So I'll get mm. my foot on yeah, and I'll just yeah. totally just look drag back. Can't do that on a Shimano. Mm. So I'd be like, opposite for me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You'd be the opposite. So yeah, you're dead right. Good point. So mm. that, that's not the only rumour floating around. There's one on the vital forum of, of Continental Nuke Proof becoming Continental with GT providing the frames and, and Danny Hart joining the team. Emmy, you've got contacts at Continental. Is there anything you can fill us in on here? Um, I've asked my friends at Conti and I haven't really commented on it. Pretty yep. ignored. <laughs> the important <laughs> part of the message. But uh, I respect it. I mean, yeah. they're probably still figuring things out. And... Um, if if Danny were to be joining a team, that would be great for them because obviously Ronan has left. Yeah. yeah so good, there's yeah. like the big riders is gone. So that would be a real good signing for them. So it would be yeah. we're stoked on that. Yeah, definitely. Cool. And here's one more for you. I was chatting with Martin Whiteley after the last show and I told him our best guess for the third rider on Frameworks was was Angel Suarez. That that was who we thought. I don't know if we actually said that on the show or whether we um whether we just uh, discuss that afterwards if you remember he said the third rider had been on a world cup podium and, and he offered up a selection of other riders it could be so george brannigan thomas stack connor fearon brooke mcdonald baptiste Pierron, antoine vidal gaitan vige or mark wallace brooke i think you would say world cup winner rather than podium baptiste i think told you he was staying at Dorval, is that? Yeah, he told me he was happy where he was. And so I'm, I'm sure Vidal told me that as well. Yeah, I think I've seen yeah, Vidal on a team camp this week. So I don't know if he'd be on a team camp if he was moving on. But 
anyone on that list that you think would be a good fit instead of Angel? I know that George Brannigan was having conversations with NS and and that team simply because I think it's centered around George has had a difficult couple of years um, yeah. and he's, he's he's doing his best to come back to his, his best, but Kai's doing really well. And obviously teams only have a certain amount of budget, so yeah. maybe George has found uh, another direction there. I I can't see Thomas Estat leaving Common Cell. <laughs> no. Um, I can't see that at all. So that, that for Gaitan me, might be a good shout. Yeah, 100%. You know? Easy signing. He's a top 60 rider after his fifth at Montserrat. <laughs> Only actually raced one final last year and one semi final, yep. but got a fifth. So he was, I think, 40 something in the overall. Yeah. Um, and more importantly, just showed that he's got the pace. So, yep. and then you've just said that Mark Wallace might be on the move. Um, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Right. Well, we've only been going for 15 minutes, but I think we need to pause for a little break and, uh, and gather ourselves perhaps uh, before we move on to the next part. So we'll be back with more after these messages. From the suspension experts at JTEC Suspension comes WPS, an all-new brand focused on making the very best suspension upgrades, parts, and tooling, all made in the UK. With a growing network of the very best suspension service centers in the UK and beyond, and drawing on years of experience, WPS is the best thing that ever happened to your suspension. To find out more, visit WPS-MTB.com. Hi there, it's Jordan Williams from Specialized Gravity. We've just had a mega week from Ride Some in Spain. And our top group was here. We had Charlie Hatton and Joe Breeden, so we had we had some tough competition, but yeah, awesome tracks, awesome uplift. There was some amazing views, and for sure the bike took a beating. So if you come along, make sure you bring your spares. But yeah, awesome week, awesome group of people. Andy's an amazing guy, and all the other people that are there helping out. Just I couldn't ask for much more, really. Uh, good laugh, and there's a pool there to jump in after a good day's riding. It's pretty cold, so good recovery and yeah there's some nice places to eat so get yourself along because it's it's a good laugh and good fun cheers so at the end of each season we usually see a top rider or multiple riders stepping away from world cup racing and i thought it would be interesting to ask them all the same 20 questions the idea isn't unique i stole it from a tv program called inside the actor's studio we've done a few now I think Sick Mick declined last year, but in the past we've done this with Tracy Hammer, Hannah. We did one with Emmy. Um, did we do one with Flo Pay? Yeah. Did we just, did I you, think so. Did we do yeah, Flo Pay? Yeah. So go and out, dig out those episodes if you haven't listened. This season, one of the riders who's announced his retirement from World Cup racing is our very own Jack Redding. Jack started racing World Cups in 2010, so he's done 14 seasons at the very highest level and represented Team GB at the 2017 Worlds in Cairns. He's seen a lot of change in that time. So let's get into it. Emmy, do you want to kick us off? Sure, sure. So first question, Jack. Um, favorite World Cup track? It's weird being interviewed by you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Um, yeah, I mean, tough one because, as George just said, I've been there so long. It used to be Val de Sol when it was raw and just like, mm -hmm. loose. you'll remember that, Emmy. Um, then it became a little bit of like a Montserrat, love Montserrat. Um, so it was between those two, but then this year, like absolutely loved that Andorra track, like just fast, flat out, like really yeah, loved it. Yeah. I think it's cause it's so similar to our test track in Portugal. Right. Um, and smiles per miles this year was definitely Ludenville. Like, um, yeah. so yeah, over the course of my career, it'd be half Val de Sol, half Montserrat for sure. Okay. Um, and what about your least favorite track? Old school Leo Gang can fuck off. I've said this many times before. <laughs> I've, told, I've, I've told you What's I wrong with it? I just hated Everything. how tight it was. It, it, yeah. I've, I've been 61st there. I've concussed myself there. Up, up until the rule change in 2018, I'd only not qualified between 2010 and 2018. I think I'd only not qualified five times. Four of those were in Leo Gang. Like, 
and and usually it was just like something stupid. So I hated that place, but then I came 19th there in 2017, and that's what got me to Worlds, George. So I kind of let the place off. But I I, I actually think my least favorite track is Croatia. <laughs> Leo Gang sticks with me more because I've been there so many times. But we yeah. only went to Croatia once. Yeah, there was death rocks in the wet, and it's super super short. So yeah, I, I think that the track that I'd like least like to go back to to race a World Cup would be Lachine. Did it? Did it ever yeah. rain there though? I, my pick. I went there testing in the wet. Oh yeah, yeah. And holy it. shit! Like you, can, yeah. you can't get down it. It's just glass yeah. with water on it. Yes, just just like the rogue gardens at home. So <laughs> it yeah, was. They saw I like it, but yeah, very familiar. So third question for Jack: greatest rival. Um, difficult to pick one. When I was going through my earlier years, like me and my old man, we'd always have like Brits in mind that I was trying to beat. So for many years, Matt Simmons and Joe Smith were on the menu. They were like guys that I was like, if I can beat those two, I've done well. I'd say potentially greatest rivals, Brayton. Um, yeah. like we've had our words in the past and always liked to be in front of Brayton. <laughs> got a lot, got a lot of respect for the guy as a racer and always used to enjoy it when I'd come down and be like, I've got him. Got him today. Didn't happen many times. <laughs> there, Roos and Rain will show you that. But but yeah, yeah I'd, I'd potentially say greatest rivals probably Brayton. Nice. And best mate on the circuit? Well, I mean, for for three years, I actually had my best friend on my race team. So it has to be Will's um, for sure. Um, Will Jones, who was on my team between 2016 and 2018. Um, other people I've got on really well with, like Mick, Mick Hanna, Laura Greenland, people like that, where I've kind of had good times with on the bike and stuff. But but yeah. Nice. Biggest strength. No fucker's going to outwork me. Hardest worker, <laughs> for sure. Like I came into the sport late and I think I was 21 or 22 when I went to my first World Cup, but kind of always been on the, like, felt like I've been chasing the others skills wise and experience wise. And just, I've just worked my ass off to just, first of all, get in there and then stay there over the last 10 years, just keep trying to keep up with modern kind of techniques and riding styles and <clears throat> equipment and set up and yeah, just work my ass off. So even now I've retired, I've joined a CrossFit gym and I'm training harder now than I probably ever have. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you never got that factory ride. No. Do you think you could have got, how much further could you have got if you had, do you think? If you, cause you, you've always had other things on and I, I think I've got this in the fucking, in the clothes that, you know, you did your degree, you've done your, you've been an optometrist. You've always had to support, you're racing basically yeah. how much further do you think you could have gone i could have got podiums and i know that because i've had top five splits i've had the speed but i've always had imposter syndrome because i've never been accepted onto a factory team um so yeah i've i've, I've had the speed but those other factors that i think if in my early 20s i'd been accepted onto a factory team and been guided I feel like top tens for sure, and maybe even some podiums because I've got the splits there that prove even this year with my sixth, fa sixth fastest through that split in Andorra, like, and then I just wound on it, wound it on a little bit too much, uh, which I've always done because, as I said, imposter syndrome. I've struggled to know where that line is, so yeah. But I don't regret that for a minute. It's just the journey I've been on. It's put me where I am now, and it's why I'm so passionate about the coaching. So, um, yeah, we we will never know, George. Greatest achievement. Thought about this one. I saw in the script. Um, I think it has to be going to world champs. Yeah. As a Brit, I never thought for a minute I'd make it into that top seven <clears throat> to go to to worlds and represent. Um, and when I managed to go in 2017, that was that was pretty emotional. And then the fact that it was on a track that I really didn't like, um, Cairns. I was on the biggest bike on the circuit, so trying to get it round that Nikolai around those corners at the top was tough. And to go from, I think I was like 56th at that track the year before at the World Cup to then come 12th in my race run at the top split and then just make one mistake and get 25th. I was like, I was pretty emotional at the bottom of that race. I think it's one of the only times I've ever had a good race and like being like quite teary at the bottom because I was so kind of, kind of proud of how I'd done. So yeah, I think there's a few in there, but the Worlds in 2017 was probably the one I look back at and go, fucking hell yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to I tell the that. Kids, I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Biggest regret. Crashing in the important runs, letting imposter syndrome get the better of me in the important runs. Val de Sol 2011, when I were qualified 12th and was top 10 in the splits at the top and then crashed. And um, there was another one, I think Half Gel qualified 14th and maybe crashed. Um, Val de Sol again, 
qualified 14th, crashed. So, yeah, those <clears throat> not having, not keeping my head and trusting myself, which is what I drum into my athletes now. You are the person who rode that bike down that hill. Nobody else. Just go out the next day, enjoy it and have some fun. Do the same as what you're doing. And I just wish I'd been able to tell myself that on those important runs throughout my career. Even Andorra this year, like it was, uh, it wasn't quite the same because my quality had just been average. So I didn't have that really good qualifying to go off the back of, but, um, but yeah, I've done it all the way through. And I, if there's one thing I really could change, it would be, um, to have got it across the line in one of those runs where it would have been a top 10. Do you, do you think all that's made you a better coach though? A hundred percent, hundred percent. Because if y- your weaknesses are what, like, yeah, the weaknesses you have and the things that you, the areas you can improve in yourself, if you're willing to accept that, you'll become a better athlete and a better, better anything. And I've always had to kind of do that in my career to keep trying to improve. Um, so that's what I try and do with my athletes. I don't call them weaknesses because my athletes are quite young. And if you start telling them they've got weaknesses, they'll usually take their bat home. So, um, so yeah, it, it certainly helps me kind of try and help those guys not make the same mistakes I've made because I've made a lot of them. So, um, whereas, you know, for someone like, like Loic or Greg, who's just been incredibly successful throughout their whole career, like, they, they don't know where someone more in the pack is coming at it from. Obviously, they've made mistakes and it's not always gone their way. But, um, you know, someone like Andy Kolb or Ben Wire would probably be an amazing coach when they finish because of the path they've took. And you're going to talk about that later with Andy. But someone who's worked their way through and gone all the way through, I can, you know, I could see that being a good coach. Favourite memory? This again, I saw this in the script and I was like, fuck. Like, I, a part of me wants to say, like memories around results but i don't have genuine memories from when it happened if that makes sense a really like strong memory is when i won my only british race british national race um i beat pe matt simmons and mark beaumont three guys who i'd always looked up to as being like you know top of the sport especially pe obviously um watched him win worlds in 2009 before i even dreamed of racing a world cup so to beat him at a british race was cool and then to stand on the podium with my best friend who'd come fifth was I, re- I can remember that whole experience acutely. My family was there and it was the whole team was there. That was, that was absolutely sick. So yeah, that, I think that one's got to be kind of center frame really. Cool. Okay. Um, next question, your best race run. Um, I, oh, I thought about this one as well. And to be honest, I struggled to, uh, mm. struggled to find one really, uh, <laughs> in, in, my, in my memory bank. I was like, which one stands out as like, I genuinely don't know. You might have to come back to me. I mean, I, off stats, I'd have to say coming 18th at Lenzide because it's my best ever World Cup result. I was like mm-hmm. one point something off a top 10. I remember only making one mistake and being happy when I crossed the line. So yeah, it'd have to be that, you know, from stats okay. and from like, thinking about it, it would have to be 2017 coming 18th at Lenzide. And again, that was one of the results that, that got me to World Champs. So mm. go out. Do, do you know how many World Cup starts you got? I, I worked it out before Montedown. I think I qualified 67 times. Okay. Yeah. Up until 2018, I only not qualified five times. And then obviously they made it top 60. And since then, in that time frame, there's maybe been another like somewhere between 10 and 20 I've not, I've not made. So I think I've been to between 80 and 100 World Cups and raced about 67. Nice. I know, um, I know you crashed, but I think Andorra for me is my favorite of yours. Just, just because. I wasn't expecting, like, you come onto the screen and you're green and I'm like, oh my God. Like, I I I genuinely think if that, if I don't regret that day at all because I gave it my best. So what could I possibly regret? If I hadn't given it my best, my splits might have been like 25th, 30th, and I might have crossed the line and, you know, who gives a shit? So I threw everything at it and I was sick in that fourth sector, which put me about 15th or 16th by that split, but I was picking up speed. And I think the time gap in finals from fifth, which was a podium, to 15th was less than a second. And if I was picking up speed, who knows where I would have finished if I'd stayed on. So to think that, you know, I was I was doing that is is cool and, you know, is what it is. But But yeah, as you say, it would have been really nice to cross that line and, you know, see it go green and get a top 10 or whatever, but you can't have regrets like that in professional sport because mm. I tried my hardest that I can't ask for more. Okay. So I ask you about your, your best race run and what's the best race run you've ever seen, like from another rider? Yeah. Tough to pick. Um, I, I've got to go with a Gwynny from back in his heyday. 
it's either Wyndham when he just destroyed everyone by oh, yeah. two seconds on that short track when we watched it, we were just like, what is happening? Because it was this, it, it, he was visibly faster than everyone else and it was just insane. Obviously, the Leo Gang run without a chain was just, yeah, it was nonsensical, really. Like, fairly peddly track in places and he, he won it without a chain. So, yeah, got, got to go with a Gwynny. Um, you know, there's other ones in there from Mont Saint Anne. Legend, yeah, Monster and the Wet. Um, that's mine. That's the best I've ever seen. I yeah, think. exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, Gwynny in his heyday. It's not to put down anyone like Pierron or any of those boys. Lo- Loic's Andorra run where was it? Loic or Vergier who won that one? It was Loic, wasn't it? When Vergier yeah. did a sick time, and then all of a sudden Loic mm-hmm. went like yeah. three seconds green at the first split, and we were like, so there's other runs in there, but I think uh, one of those one of those Gwynny ones from like 2015 kind of time was. Uh, was up there. Do you remember the Bryceland one when in half year when he just like was about to be world champion and he just yeah. broke his foot? <laughs> yeah, and he was like he'd like been sitting down. He'd like <laughs> classic Bryceland just like chilling between the sectors and then he come flying into that jump and hadn't hit it fast all week. That's what he said. So then he hit it quick, landed to flat, broke his foot and rolled across the line for third. No point the world win. Yeah. When I read the question, I was like, think about that. And then yeah. I was just like remember that because i was there i remember that moment i was like oh my god that was also a good one i can't actually remember any of his runs from that 2014 season but that yeah year, the, the monster then one was pretty it was also pretty crazy yeah like he was on fire that year Burn. yeah it's, it's incredible and we'll speak to andy about it later on how in this sport when you get on a run you see it time and time again, people get on a run they'll, and they'll get, like Andy got his first podium and then the next three months, I think he had another four. He's on one. podium. It's yeah. just, yeah, and wins with Danny. We oh. saw him win three in a row and then, you know, you've seen Pierron do it. Right. Oh, and Rachel, <laughs> the yeah, best yeah. example. Well. <laughs> when I look back at result, I was just like, how did you even not quit the sport? Like when she was winning the whole year. Yeah. It just shows yeah. how much it's a mental sport. And if you can, mm. once that switch flicks it for whatever reason, if you can then hold that there and ride that wave of confidence and commitment, you're the same athlete that you were the week before, but you're five to 10% faster just simply because mm. your brain's allowing you to do that. And that's where sports psychologists come into the sport. Like I, I think like right? it'll help more people be able to do that because they're able to understand themselves better. What would be my take on? So what's your biggest crash? Oh, easy. Mega avalanche this year. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking so. <laughs> if that if that wasn't on the snow, I would have I would have been fucking dead. Like mm-hmm. fifty odd mile an that- hour into a sinkhole, flipped me over the bars. I was crashing for about hundred meters. Felt like I was in a washing machine. I actually remember crashing thinking I'm gonna die. It was going on that long. Like I was I remember spiraling and flipping and so yeah, that one for sure. Um and I've I've I kind of I've I've not been forced to sign up again next year, but it's it's in my SR Sun Tour contract <laughs> to represent them at the Mega next year. And I kind of thought long and hard about whether I was going to do it again. And then I was like, well, I don't want to, but I'm a professional mountain biker and I race my bike for a living. So I need to stop being a little bitch basically and get on with it. But I will I definitely be surveying that glacier in more detail before <laughs> we drop in. <laughs> knowing where the holes are, taking less risk, like... I'm, all, I'm already pitying the race organizer. Huh? <laughs> I'm already pitying the race organizer. I oh, man. I'll, I'll just put it all on myself. I'll just literally just look at it all. And yeah, like yeah. I, I'm not going to have the fitness to win. I know that because those boys are so fit on the climb. So I'm not taking huge risks on that glacier just to like get past anyway. So I'll just get myself down, I think. <laughs> Whether the adrenaline will let me do that when the helicopter starts flying over my head, yeah. I'm not sure. But that'll be the plan. <laughs> but... um, worst injury? Uh, my shoulder, 20, 22, 21. So my shoulder, 21. And not the dislocation. The second one, but once again, Leo Gang. Fuck Leo Gang. Um, that dislocate, that damage to all my rotator cuffs in my shoulder is actually only just better now. I'd got it to a really good level in the summer where it wasn't bothering me on the bike, but I still had a few little, like, niggles with it but the back off the back of um how long we've been on from Mont Saint now um it's almost two months isn't it off the back of like seven eight weeks of crossfit um surprisingly it's made it so much better because i'm putting the shoulder through such like um a range of um 
yeah. motion under the different exercises and the coaches at the CrossFit I'm going to are so good. There's never has never been a point where it's actually been at risk and it's it's better now. But that shoulder injury affected me all the way through 2021, all the way through 2022. And then it played up again this April, May. And I saw a physio in June and that kind of leveled it out for the season. So yeah, it wasn't like a, a horrendous injury like you see like people having, but it, in terms of how it affected my racing, um, that one for sure. So biggest feature, has there been a line or feature that psyched you out? Yeah, there have for sure. And I was again, driving back from the gym before thinking there's been features on World Cup tracks that I've like said to people, I, I don't get paid enough to do that. But I'm really struggling to like remember one of them, if that makes sense. Like obviously that Leo Gang stem gap or something like the gap that everybody's doing Leo Gang, for example. Like the boys. In the top stumps. Yeah. That's what I did my shoulder on in twenty two. Oh yeah. So I, I was doing that. That's in pretty terrifying. Last year. Yeah, yeah, but as I said, I did it. Whereas there have been mm. lines at so like you know the gap at the bottom of the old Andorra track that Bernard and Vergier and a few others used to oh, do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I never did that, but it never really scared me that much because I was like, yeah, it's just a gap. I just know I'm not going fast enough to get it. Um but there were some terrifying lines on tracks that I definitely didn't do. But I just can't at the moment recall any of them. If any of them come back to me today, yeah. I'll tell you tonight, George, when we're interviewing Andy. But there are definitely some horrific ones where like certain people have done them and I've just been like, nope. The comp for me is there. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite bike. Yeah. Thought about this one long and hard. And I think it depends on perspective. So <clears throat> like right now, it's be probably between two. One is the V10 because I had to buy that frame for this year. I bought all the frames for the guys this year because we didn't have a proper sponsorship deal. But I wanted to ride a V10 and I thought, this is potentially going to be my last World Cup season. Let's let's have a go on one of these things, see what all the hype's about. Unbelievable bike. Loved it. But I think casting my mind back, it has to be my Ellsworths. Like back then, <laughs> I was just finishing uni. Like I was going off to be an optometrist and was also able to go race World Cups against my heroes. And a company were willing to give me frames and etch my name on them and call me a, their professional rider. When really, I, to me, it was just my hobby that I was like lucky enough to go and do at World Cups at remembering back to that stage. And then I'd nip back to uni again, do some exams. So to have that bike back then, I, I oh man, I loved those bikes. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say my Ellsworth days were like when I was like at my youngest and at my most enthusiastic to like the freshness of sponsorship. Whereas now it's just a job. I'm just like, gather the sponsorship for the team let's get this going da, 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 da. and the, the bikes arrive and my riders are excited and i'm just like right no no this is like work these are tools like so <laughs> but they're all good now aren't they we're not they might be yeah yeah i'm not coming at it from a favorite like no favorite, like in terms of working perspective i mean jesus that v4 when i first got on the v4 in 2019 that was the one that everyone called the magic carpet so at that time, the V4 was probably the best bike I've ever yeah. had. That makes sense. And now the V10, I'm more meaning from like a personal, like my yeah. memories of having the bike. I'd, I'd have to probably say it was the Ellsworths in like 2009, 2010, 11. Favorite thing about racing? When it goes well. When you're at a weekend, this one was easy to answer. Like just like, like when I won the British round and I've had a few World Cups where everything's just you're enjoying every part of it. You enjoy practice. You're even at the top warming up going, I fucking got this. Like, and then you do your race run and you know, it's a good one. Um, and then you cross the line and you have that feeling of satisfaction. Like just when everything's singing all dancing, which doesn't happen often, like everybody, <laughs> I can count it on one hand probably <laughs> race weekends where things have just lined up and you've gone, yeah, that was sick. I've done my best there. Cause even snowshoe this year, when I crossed the line and I was so happy with my race run, I was buzzing with how I'd ridden. I'd done better than I thought I would. But the weekend was a nightmare. I sliced my leg to pieces. I had to battle through. So like, you know, that you weekend, mean, not looking back and going, yeah, that, that's racing. You, that's fucking survival. That's work. So yeah, weekends when it all just connects and you're just like, this is, this is easy. Least favorite thing about racing. The opposite to what I just said. Yeah. So when you're at a race and no matter what you're doing, you never feel fast enough. You're having mechanicals. Just when you just feel up against it and then, at the end of it all, you cross the line, you're like, well, shit, I still, I, I didn't even, usually I'm, throughout my career, I've always been pretty good. Even when I'm up against it, I can like sort, my, sort myself out, go and do that race run and get the best from it. Sometimes you don't. So those were those World Cup weekends where I've not qualified 
you know, like a Leo gang where I've knocked myself out or come 61st, bullshit bit like that. Leger this year, couldn't wrap my head around the track, really. That mid sector, I just didn't like it. 61st in Glowy, that shit can fuck off. Like, you just, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think I might know the answer to that yeah, one. You know favorite this one? curse word. <laughs> favorite definitely. curse word. Yeah, definitely fuck. You can get good passion behind <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> thing you'll miss the most retiring when you cross the line, and you know, I know I'm, when I when I cross that line from a sick run, and I know I've done my best. Like that, and really cool practice sessions. So like Ludenville this year, where the track was just awesome. And everyone's just buzzing. And like, you're at a World Cup. Normally you're at a World Cup. Like Monte this year, you're at a World Cup and you know you are. Because everyone's struggling with the track. Everyone's going, are your arms there? And you're like, yeah. And then you're rolling down with a puncture and you're going, how many have you had today? And you're like, yeah, four. Those days of work, mm. where it was Ludenville, where you're just riding the sickest track and then Kate Edwards comes past you in the air with his bat wheel next to your face. And you're like, yeah, boy. And then like, mm. you know, follow someone else down and there's dirt going everywhere. So yeah, those two things probably like sick practice sessions on cool tracks and when a race run is just unreal. Yeah, Cam said that because she was like, yeah, but you don't get to race, like racing or training on walk-up track is just different. Yeah. You don't really get to no. like ride walk-up tracks and you feel like a walk-up track. It's just different yeah, it's at just, the race. So yeah. yeah, for sure. That's that's for sure something. I don't miss it, but you might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I miss it. Where I'll miss it. I'll miss the memories of it working. Like I just said, those five out of a hundred where you're like, that was easy and you get what you mm. want. But they're so rare. Yeah. Okay. So opposite of that, things you won't miss. Racing with injuries. And that, oh, that yeah. Nice thing is the direction my career is going in now with the coaching and the team management. It's still essential that I'm on track with my guys and racing with my guys so that I can coach them the way I coach people. But if I pick up an injury, I'm now going to be in a position where I don't actually have to flog myself and try and survive and still represent on the track. I can go, right, guys, I'm injured. I won't be on track. And one of my other elites will step into a little bit more of a role that I'm doing or I would normally do. So, yeah, trying to race with injuries sucks. Like, because you just know you're up against it. You know you're not performing to your best. And, it, yeah, it's Wait. just rubbish. And like you just said, I mean, like, racing's different to going riding. And if you're not doing your best, if you know you're going to go yeah. there and not do your best because of injury, it's, it's just shit. Mm. So. Yeah. So what about the future then? How long you got? <laughs> <laughs> not very long. <laughs> uh, we're going on holiday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, in a nutshell, um, I'll still be racing. A lot of people have thought I'm retiring from racing. You'll have to cut my legs off to get me to, for, you know, to retire from racing. It's my hobby, my passion. I love it. So I'll still be racing Portugal Cups, European Cups. And, and, and shit, like if in years to come, I've, if I've got points and I'm able to do a world cup that I wanted to do and it didn't affect my team in a negative way, I'd maybe participate. But you know, the professional world cup stuff is, is done. So that then now allows me to run my team how my team needs to be run. We need to make it bigger. We need to start supporting riders all the way through from juvenile up to elite so that we're developing these riders and prepping them for World Cups. Because what we've been having over the last few years is our juniors just aren't ready. It's all mm -hmm. too much of a shock. They might have flashes of brilliance, but ultimately we want to be taking our juniors to World Cups after we've worked with them for four years as juveniles and youths on the team, after they've come through the gravity school. Um, so that's the team kind of side. I want to build the team up, um, a big um, project for the winter, um, and, and obviously continuing into next year is find out of the industry sponsorship because the industry doesn't have any money. So um, we're going to be trying to improve our sales deck and, and our kind of, um, you know, you know, our visibility to, for sponsors so that more people want to associate themselves with our story and what we're doing, because we are doing a really cool thing, developing these riders and um, want to improve that, build the team infrastructure. And then off the back of that, my gravity school is synonymous with that, the team and the gravity school, they're a development project. So first, for any rider is they need to be within our gravity school. So we're working with them. And then if they show us signs of um, potential brilliance, we'll bring them into the team at whatever age they're at um, and, you know, continue to further that development. So yeah, um, that that's basically the, the, the focus now. Um, it's gone well the last couple of months. Um, the main reason I've started CrossFit is because obviously I knew I need to keep training to stay sharp, to be able to race these guys because they're fast. 
fast as fast as fuck using my favorite curse word there um, <laughs> and i need to stay fit and strong to be able to get you know give them a run for their money so that Boom. they can see my splits and i can give them feedback on on getting faster um and i knew i wouldn't want to train stepping away from world cups my gym's in the house i knew i wouldn't want to use it so i packed it away put it at the back and um, last few weeks has just been training every day down there and working on my laptop and uh, putting everything together and we're at a point where we sent out our rider contracts this week and uh, yeah everything's shaping up good and kind of super excited to get everyone to Portugal and and start kind of oh yeah I'm gonna have a media team on the on the team now so interviewing cool. guys to run media for us so we'll be telling our story properly on YouTube rather than me with an iPhone getting shit shots <laughs> retrospectively after someone's done something um <laughs> which I've absolutely hated having to do so um we're gonna have a media crew with us to produce all that kind of stuff bring in a second mechanic um yeah it's there's loads changing it's loads of stuff i want to be doing so although the only part that's going to be missing is me not actually racing world cups everything feels pretty similar really so cool. yeah it's good and that gym nope. that you've packed away has sarah nabbed that for a playroom for blake yet funny, funny actually my dad's building as a porch because of blake and the prams and every other accessory she's bought in we need like a, a bit of a porch out front so while that's being built everyone's coming in through the gym so yeah it's the gym's like a, a pram park now so um yeah so, two last questions from me not connected to these what, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt and you can't um, you can't have optometry in there because that's your profession as well it's funny so. i'm going to mention that in, on the next one um fire pilot for sure um, I tried to drop out of uni halfway through first year to go and be a fighter pilot. My dad, my dad, <laughs> Jack, it's not Top Gun. You do know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> was in my naivety. I think I thought it was. Um, so yeah, I'd love to give that a crack. Um, other ones like F1 driver. I mean, that's cool as fuck, isn't it? <laughs> and what profession would you not like to do? Optometry. That's shit. <laughs> <laughs> really shit. Like that's one of the reasons I'm the hardest worker in the room because I've done a real job that's shit and I don't want to do it anymore like I did four days yeah. of it in 2022 I've done none this year um yeah it's it's really boring I, I'm not going to go into what all the reasons but yeah the other job I wouldn't want to do I was thinking about this you know when you come back from a flight and you're going into passport control and you've got that poor fucker going one in three one in seven one in eight one in nine one in one one in two one in five and you're going to the the electronic passports and that is a shit day <laughs> that? that's a really shit day you'll probably see one of them later Emmy, when you're uh yes airport and after i've said that you'll go oh sorry mate yes. yeah so that one the fun. <laughs> well congratulations from us all on a fabulous career it's incredible you know what you've achieved particularly given that you only moved up to elite in 2010 and as we as i mentioned earlier you never had the, the luxury of being on a factory team for anyone who's unaware, you did, you did your degree alongside your racing when you started off, then you worked as an optometrist, and as well as racing, you've always run the team. So good skills, and and uh, I'm sure we'll keep up with you because you're going to be on here. So best of luck for the future. Yeah, cheers, mate. Much appreciated. Thanks, Emmy. So we now bid farewell to Emmy for a bit. Enjoy your holiday. Yeah, I'm not jealous. Yeah, two weeks you're in not? Brazil. Well, you've been in Portugal as well, so... Yeah, you're going to Brazil. I haven't seen sunshine in a while. (laughs) It's starting to get dark, I need to put the light on. Yeah, Well, safe (laughs) travels to you, and Jack and I will be back with Jack on the other side of the mic with Andy Kolb after these messages. My name is Amory Pion, and I asked Shralby to develop the best Donald tire ever. Amory asked us for something that offers an edge over... Magic Mary. We are all looking for something new, I guess. We needed something for more precision. So from that, we just worked all together to, to make it happen. Being fair, actually, the team started the development. Maxime, he started to cut down a big betty and try to get it into shape to make it work. The grip is just perfect. The tacky jam just gives you the best precision you, you need. It just gives you a lot of braking traction, safety, and corner hold. It's like riding on rails. So if you're an active rider, it's super rewarding. If you're a passive rider, it's still a fantastic time. If you're enjoying the Making Up the Numbers podcast, hit subscribe now so you don't miss an episode and drop us a review whenever it's convenient. For additional content, follow us on Instagram at Making Up the Numbers Racing. Choose single track. Choose print, choose digital. 
Choose an independent mountain bike magazine. Choose mountain bike culture. Choose adventure and mishap. Choose great stories and glorious photography. Choose ad-free access to our website. Choose time out with a mug of tea. Choose an annual subscription. Choose a monthly subscription. Choose discounts in our shop on a range of ethical products. Choose bobble hats. Choose hip flasks. Choose gift subscriptions for your friends. Choose single trap salvation for your arse. Choose a username. Choose a community. Choose to support independent publishing. Choose your future and our future. Choose single track. This time last week, he was feeding elephants in Thailand, but now he's back home in Austria, and I imagine regretting a few of those holiday cocktails. Andreas Kolb, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Hello. Um, yeah, doing good. Just had one one cocktail, actually. Didn't drink anything, really. Yeah, it's crazy. Only mocktails. <laughs> Just one cocktail in the whole uh, holiday. Yeah, it's crazy, I know. But I think I had a few, few parties after the season, and I was a bit over it already. Yeah, I'm all a massive party guy. So yeah, just a nice time with the girlfriend and yeah, nice. enjoyed the sun, the cool. vitamin D before the cold time in Austria. Indeed. So we tried to set this episode up at the end of last season and we just couldn't get the schedules aligned and it never got done, nor throughout the season. But it, it's been a, sh- a show that we've been desperate to do because you're kind of booking the trend in the world of downhill at the moment, a, a late bloomer, so to speak. You're 27 now. Looking on Roots and Rain, I can see you started racing on there in 2013 as a first-year junior. Is that correct, or were you doing smaller races before that in, in Austria? Uh, I did smaller races in 2012. Right. I did, I think, three, three races, but yeah. only like fun category. And yeah. 2013, I started racing with license and yeah, a bit more international. So well, what's the kind of background? How did you get into doing bikes? Um... I think I got into it because of the World Cup in Schladming. Right, okay. Uh, I used to go there and watch with my mom together and just watch the four cross races, which was always a highlight for me, and the downhill, of course. Yeah. And I remember, actually, I, I told my mom I will never do something like this because it's so dangerous. <laughs> but yeah, and I was just obsessed with it and watching it, following Marcus Peck a little bit on Facebook and stuff like this. Right. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. Bought my first real downhill bike when I had some money when I was working as a car, as a car mechanic. And yeah, that, that was pretty much the start of everything. Cool. So 2014, you were a second year junior. Leo Gang, you came ninth. <laughs> five seconds back on Amory. I think that was Isn't- Amory's only win as a junior or first win as a junior. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, Hafiel, world champs, 10th, 13 seconds back on Loris. It's notable that in those first few years, you, you raced, you only really raced locally. Leah Gang, Slag, Sladming, Maribor, and then you went off to do world championships with kind of the national team. Was that a, was that because of a like financial situation or was it that your focus on racing just, it, it wasn't that great, it wasn't that important? Uh, the focus was definitely there, but I, yeah, first thing was financially. Yeah. I was working as a car mechanic, so not big money in there, of course. Yeah. And all the time you work, uh, 38 and a half hours. So like full week and then you get the weekend off and you have limited time, which you can take off for racing. I remember like I went to European champs, went home, drove home from Poland, arrived at home at 5 a.m. and had to go to work at 7 a.m. So it was quite a tough deal, I think. Do you think that's given you extra kind of motivation? Oh, for sure. For sure. And I think just I appreciate everything a bit more than others, I would say. Yeah. yeah. When I talk to someone and they're like, oh, everything shit, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, you have no clue how good your life is. Yeah. Like, if you don't have like a nine to five job like normal people do, yeah. the life we, we have as a worker race is insane. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely always a good motivation. If, um, if I don't want to go to a gym or something, I'm like, ah, I could be underneath a car right now. Like, the salt water dropping onto my head and just hating my life. So I think it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. So, so you, 2014, you were the Austrian junior national champion. Did that change things at all? Uh, not really. No? Nah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then 2015, you moved up to elite. And I think 14th at the Leo Gang IXS was your, your kind of best result of the season. Did, did, did you struggle to adapt to life in elite? Oh, yeah, definitely. I yeah. I think I wanted to show it straight away that I'm that I'm fast in the first year, but broke my I don't know how you call it the upper arm straight on the beginning of the season, and then just yeah, it crashed his pretty bad material as well as well. 
like some tires, I don't want to say which brand in the industry. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't really lucky when it comes to material the first couple of years as well. Yeah. But yeah, it was a big struggle, definitely. So I have to ask you about the, the 2015 Austrian national champs in Innsbruck. The race was won by Colombian Marcelo Gutierrez <laughs> with Windmasters in second. So I'm guessing David Trummer took the jersey as he was in third. Marcus Peckle in fourth and yourself in fifth. The track, though, Marcelo won with a 9 minutes 45. You crossed the line 39 seconds back with a 10.25. W- was this from the, the pinnacle of the mountain to the foot of the valley? or? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. But to be fair, it was my favorite uh, track at the time. Right. I was loving it because everybody was hating it. Um, like a kind of thing I have, I think. If everybody hates something, I love it. Just right. like, okay. I know, mentally it helps me. And... It was a weird race. It was a, a show race, it's just like so people can come there it's straight next to a city in Innsbruck. Yeah. A lot of people come to watch it. It's just people, yeah, just want to see people race. It's not like an actual real down race where you have like good competition. And they gave me a number 15 or something, I think. And I had to overtake three people <laughs> and I crashed twice while overtaking. So I, I had no chance against the top boys. And I remember I, I was I was on uh, I think I could have won the race. Like maybe not Marcelo, but the Austrian dance for sure. Still a bit angry about this one. <laughs> <laughs> and was that at that time, was that kind of normal to be racing for ten minutes for you or was that a one off? Yeah, that was my first solid race I ever won a uh, year before. Right. How was it? Two years before. It was it was really good. I won two thousand euros on that day. Wow. Well, the prize money was insane. Uh, yeah. That was my first race I ever won. I got 2,000 euros out of it. This is sick. <laughs> I got all the money in this sport. <laughs> yeah. I think it took me three or four years to, to earn that much money with prize money in total after that. Is that more than you got for winning the World Cup this year? No, uh, this year, 3,750 euros you get. That's a bit more. 10 years later and it's a, a World yeah. Cup. Yeah, crazy. A bit more. So, Andy, moving into 2016, and you lined up for four World Cups, d would at the first three, and then kind of got a bit of a rhythm going at the end. 18th at European Championships, 42nd in Val Nord, 28th at World Championships in Val Do you remember much about that season? If you do, can you can you tell us about the emotions of like how you felt not qualifying three times, but then turning it around into a positive at the end? Um, yeah, I remember there was also the season where we still struggled with tyres pretty bad. And in mid-season, we changed to a different brand and it just changed everything. Wow. I remember I couldn't ride my bike before and just the tires we had. If there was one drop of water on the track, you couldn't ride anymore. It was super bad. No regret. And it was super hard. It's hard compound and yeah, just a big struggle. Um, but yeah, I, I really struggled with my mind that season because I thought it's on me. Yeah. And luckily, we were allowed to change the tires and uh, I could see that it's something else and not myself it's crazy that tires you know that they can make that that one part can make such a big difference i mean i know they say but but that's a huge difference yeah i think tires is one of the biggest things for sure like right now like we have conti and i think everybody saw it last year everybody who wasn't conti was on a on a good like season yeah for sure okay so then we moved into 2017 you did one world cup and focus more on the ixs series um top 10 are all but one of those was it a conscious choice to stick to the IXS, find your feet, find some consistency, improve your race craft, win some races, or did sponsors ask you to do those races? Um, yeah, first of all, sponsors. I wanted to do more World Cups, but I went to New Zealand in the winter before and um, did my AC joint in my shoulder. Yeah. Like very last jump in Rotorua, the, the sixth step of which, which was there before the old track. Okay. It was like, a month of New Zealand, we rode bikes every day. It was the sickest month ever. And I just, yeah, fucked it. Sorry. On the, on the last 50 meters of the whole trip. Um, so yeah, it was, it was not the best start in the season that I had to take, um, well, had to stop for three months, I think. Okay. Came back for the IXS Cup in Schlappning, thought like, home race, I can do this one easy. Uh, did my other shoulder in the second, Practice run or something like this. I think I also knocked myself out. I still don't know about that. Um, <laughs> so I had to do, um, have a break again. Uh, well, like, I think only f- 
three or four weeks, I think. And then I started racing again. I actually did my first uh, European Cup podium straight away. Yeah, okay. And it was a proper weird season. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes a little bit of sense then. I was just too too wild at the time, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Easy to do. 2018, kicked the season off with the 20th at Lachine World Cup. Um, faded away a little bit. Came back at the end of the season, second at IXS Innsbruck, and you won in Bellwald at the Swiss IXS. Did, were you happy with the season? Did you get motivation going into 2019 from those results? Uh, for sure. I mean, first top 20 in Croatia, then I broke my collarbone. That's why I faded. And for me, there was a season where I stopped working as a car mechanic in the winter. Yeah. I just did a bit of ski rental shop working, like save some money. And then I put everything on one card because I said, if that season doesn't work out, I will stop racing World Cup because it's just, yeah. I miss what I'm doing at home. Like I'm not earning any money. I'm not, I didn't really enjoy it anymore, really. Yeah. Cause it was just dressing around and getting injured, not making any money. So yeah. But luckily I found a, a ride after that and could continue the World Cup racing. Yeah. I mean, before I talk about that, that ride you had, did you feel you were getting the injuries because you were in a situation where you simply had to make it work? Otherwise, you were going to have to go back to being a car mechanic and you were like trying too hard. Does that sound? I think so, yeah. I think so. I just tried too hard, that's for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I think I also trained a bit too hard that time with working, training and racing. It was everything was too much. Yeah. If I would have trained less or worked less, it would have definitely been better. But yeah, you're always, you're always clever after it. Yeah. Well, you get it right now. So you obviously learn from yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so. As you just said, you found a ride, moved to Gamux 2019, and you really broke through. Uh, 24th in Maribor, 26th in Fort William, 33rd Val de Sol, 33rd Lens Hyde, and 30th in Snowshoe with great consistency there. Um, was that, would you say that season was kind of the turning point for you or not? Um, I remember I was really not happy with the, with the season because I didn't do a single top 20 that year. Yeah. I think. We went way too big on the bike, I think. It was okay. nearly 500 reach or something, the old commercial. Yeah, okay. And I thought it would be the sickest bike ever, but I couldn't really ride with it. Yeah, okay. It was such a special bike. Yeah. But yeah, it was definitely consistent. Yeah. But on another note, I had another injury, broke my hand once in Leo Gang. It was another season with an injury. So yeah, that was still, still an ongoing thing. Yeah, for sure. So one thing I noticed about, about your races is that you race quite a lot. So in 2019, you raced 15 times in, in just over five months, which is basically two weekends on, one weekend off it? for the whole summer. It might sound a strange thing to ask, but kind of I've met footballers for whom it's just a job. And we've talked about you being a car mechanic and, you know, trying to break through into this. Do you love it? Do you love the actual racing? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, there's nothing else. The best thing for me. And the second part to this question was going to be that you don't, you know, you're, that, you're doing that many races, you don't miss many races through injury, but you've actually had quite a lot of injuries. Yeah, I never took much time off. I think collarbone, three weeks off. And it broke my hand, not even three weeks. Wow. I like put a cast on, which I could ride with. It never worked out. Like I always did that at the next race, but I, I just wanted to try it. Yeah. When I'm here at the Ken ride, I will, I didn't, but wow. if I think about it now, I would never do it again. Like, uh, yeah. But there's so <laughs> many parallels with you and Benoit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just the yeah. way you've, you've come through, the way you've stuck at it and the success you've had, even winning world cups this season, you know, first world cups. It, it's so similar. It's so sick. Yeah. Like I always, I always looked up to Benoit. I guess he was always a bit better than me. And when he started to do, to do bo podiums at the World Cups, I was like, this is sick. I can do it as well. Yeah. If he can do it, I can do it. And also when he won Leger this year, so it's, yeah, it was a cool to see for me, even if I got sick. Nice. So 2020, the shortened season that we all remember because of COVID, um, as George just talked about there, it was Benoit's breakthrough season. Um, and he quoted that he kind of worked super hard in the summer to prep himself for that year when other people maybe didn't stick with it. You um, seeded 21st at Worlds and finished 22nd, 15th at the two races in Maribel, 17th and 14th at the two loser races, and 21st in the overall. Would you say that you were in the same position as Benoit as you saw it as a huge opportunity to prepare yourself and went into those races in, in September like the best you'd ever be? Or were there more injuries? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I need to think about it. No, I think I just did... I don't know how you call it, my elbow a little bit, like the liquid bag in my elbow. I have no clue how it's called in English. Oh yeah. 
like a hematoma. Did no, 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 no. I crashed on it on my home trail, just like okay. A manual loop out, but pretty fast. And I did it twice because I straight jumped back on my bike and tried to crash on it again. So it was wasn't a great injury, but yeah, still something. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that season was just the, the bike we had was the big thing. Was that the gamut still? Yeah. Yeah. We had some big struggles there. Okay. So even though you had some good results, you still, you were kind of, you felt like you were limited by the equipment a little bit, a little bit. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So good results coming through in 2020 and then obviously in 2021, the move to continental Atherton. So they'd obviously seen something in your riding. Tell us a little bit how that deal came about. Did you approach them? Did they approach you? Um, it's a funny story, actually. I wanted to stay with Gamux because we, we knew what we need to work on. And I thought I did quite well on the bike. We can make it better. So it should get better in the next season. But then there was no money for me. And I told them I can't go back working as a car mechanic or something because I don't know if I can ever get back out of it again. Yep. And Drama told me the Atherton ser- searching for for a rider and I was like yeah good joke <laughs> I will definitely get a ride there and he's like nah cool well, let's try it and I remember just sitting at home on my phone like typing a message to Lloydie our team manager and I think I just just uh, said Trauma told me you're searching for a rider still because it was already pretty late in the season it was like November or something because of COVID um, oh yeah and um, would you be interested in a top 20 rider like me or something like that and just send him a message on Instagram. And he replied on the next day, yeah, we're still searching, blah, blah, blah. Let's let's talk in the next couple of days. And I think two weeks later or something, the deal was done. I remember when I got the phone call from, from Dan Brown. I was crying afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I still, when I think about it, like I yeah. nearly still can't believe it. Made you emotional. It's so yeah. sick. Yeah. I can still remember when I was... Watching the World Cups in Schladming, getting an autograph from G and Rage. Yeah. And just watching them race. And now I'm in their team. And yeah. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. Well, all I was going to say is that's exactly it. Like you, you've had that real job. You've had the struggles to try and stay in the sport. Got to the point where you're like, fuck, if I don't get a ride on a team here, I'm going to have to go back to work. And then yeah. all of a sudden you're riding for them. It's like a dream come true, right? So yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's unreal. So 2021 bit of a step forward 16th Baribor, 11th at worlds in valdesol 15th in lenside 11th in snowshoe um 20th in the overall i mean we said a bit of a step forward there but that's consistent top 20 so i'd say that's a fair step forward um did being in the team help massively was it added pressure what was that first season like um there was definitely a bit of pressure in the beginning because i thought i need to deliver but i really have to say is it was like maybe the first two races where I felt it. And afterwards, since then, I never felt pressure in the team. Right. It's honestly it's so sick. Like Lloydy or Brownie, they never put any pressure on us. Yeah. They, they tell us like, just go up there, have fun and do what you do. That's it. Nice. It's so sick. Even if there's like an overall podium on the line or something, they don't, they don't push us into something. Yeah. And yeah, I think it just everything got way more professional. And the last race in Snowshoe, I was actually on our podium run. I remember that. I think I was like fourth in the last split. And then I just fucked up the last section. Like, <laughs> I didn't make, made everything wrong, which you can make wrong. And <laughs> even missed the top 10. I was, oh, man. I was so angry about that. But it definitely felt like the speed is there and the bike is working. And yeah, I was sick. Cool. Nice. So 2022. It just went nuts. You got that first World Cup podium in Leogang, then European champion in Maribor, fourth in Lenza Hyde, fifth in Andorra, third in Snowshoe. Tell us a bit about that kind of three-month period because it was like you just jumped to a whole other level. Was it just confidence? Oh, for sure. Yeah, confidence. is. I think everything started with Leogang. I just came back from another injury from broken elbow couple of weeks before that and on that weekend i just learned that i all i need to do is having fun and don't think about anything i like i had a massive crash before before finals run and i was just happy to make it up there do my run and then i had another problem i had a problem on my break we still don't know what happened there like maybe something dropped on it from the tree or something maybe was it front break 
No, rear brake. Rear brake wasn't working at all. Like wow. I rolled down to the start gate. I think it was like seven minutes before. I always go like pretty late to the start gate. I roll down. <laughs> oh, oh, my brake is not working. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and yeah, that was absolutely chaos. Luckily, it was our adapter, my old mechanic, Ben, my new mechanic now, and Chris, Charlie's mechanic at that time. And they changed my brake and I think brake pads and disc, I'm not sure. In like three minutes or something. Wow. We're flying out there. Holy. Get down there. Like probably the bike. Win was already lining up because he was after me. And I think that was also a bit annoying for him because I was just stressing around. <laughs> and when Howard gave me the bike and I just jumped into the stock and left the stock and I was just happy because I was racing and I wasn't thinking about anything in the run. Yeah. And yeah, since that day, I know that's the key. Don't think about it. Just yeah. do what he... What do you do? Yeah, hundred percent. Just turn the brain off. Like as I say that to the guys I coach all the time. We do a lot of thinking when we're in practice runs, but I always say to them, like, look, when you're doing your fast lap, you can't be thinking about shit. Yeah. Like just relax and go. That's it. And that I've had that what you've just described. Like I had it last year in Portugal. I had a slow puncture for my qualifying run. And my mechanic was on the pump in the start gate, inflating my rear tire to like 50 psi because we had no time to fix it and i had i had to just race the tire down the hill it's one of the best runs i've ever had i qualified <laughs> first i didn't even feel like i tried that hard because i was just like looking after the bike and just found some flow and like when you overthink the other way it just makes you slow like yeah yeah for sure it's also charlie also did his best um result of that day yeah and he was proper ill he was you can and I was I was so close to tell him like please don't don't get on your bike today it's too dangerous don't, for yeah, you yeah yeah because he yeah. was so ill and I I was feeling shit as well because of the crash and then we both did our best result ever crazy it was unreal it just shows if you don't think about it too much then that's where you, where you do well so you finished the season with second in Val Sol and fourth in the overall I know Jack was so keen to talk to you at the end of last season because that jump from being a top twenty guy top 30 guy to, to being a podium guy is probably the hardest is that accurate jack is that oh 100 and the big thing for me with wanting to talk to you about it is you've not just like done it one week and then the other week you're 30th again and then the next week you're 17th and then you're fourth you just you went from being as we've just listed like one season around the teens to all of a sudden bang i'm either gonna be winning or on the podium or there's been a huge problem and it's yeah, we just want to hear kind of your perspective on what changed. Like, is well, it things? Is it one thing? Do you even know? Because <laughs> it's so I think, cool. I think there's so many things. It's just yeah. the whole program I go through. I, think I, I always like sit down on, on the evening after the day, after the trick work, after the first training day, till like race day. I always sit down on the evening, like, is everything done? Do I need to see anything? Do I need to um, adapt somewhere? Do I need to change my mindset? Blah, blah, blah. There's so many things. Um, and I think it's just like, I'd say 10 things I, I need to do every time. And if I miss one thing, yeah, something is missing. And I think there's also the team behind me. Yeah. Lloydy, for example, he sees in Leger this year, he gave me shit when I was going slow in same as I remember. Because I was... I remember I wasn't hyped up really and he just hyped me up with that and yeah. stuff like this. He knows like, okay, he's not hyped up. I will give him some shit and <laughs> yeah. like that's how I will hype him up. Yeah. And I also got my mental coach at home, which I call, I got Pecky, who is like my mentor, which I can always call. And it's, I think for me, it's always like the personal team behind me. Helps yeah. me big time. Or Ben on the start gate. It's yeah, yeah. just all the small things. Yeah. Just keeping me happy and yeah. Eating healthy, yeah. so many things. So one big thing I'm hearing there, because I'm coming at this from a coaching perspective now from all the things I tell my guys, and one thing I'm hearing there is you are ultimately focused. Like there is no like deviation from the the, the, the goal. Like when you're at that World Cup, you're obviously, as you said, you wanted to have fun, but it doesn't sound like you're missing. You're not leaving anything un, un kind of thought through. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah, I think I, I always give, give myself like five minutes where I just talk shit with Charlie or someone yeah. and especially like when I finish my practice I come down like make some jokes with the boys and then I focus again I think I always need like a, a little bit of a, a bit downtime. No time again, or downtime yeah and then focus again if you try to be focused the whole weekend through I think you start to lose it 
Yeah, I had the problem this year a little bit with semis. I like tried to be focused all the time and then final run I was up there like I'm tired. Yeah. I'm tired. Yeah, for sure. What would your advice be? Because something I'm seeing quite frequently with young racers is they struggle with when things are hard. And obviously we can't enjoy the hard parts because they're shit, but you have to cope with it, deal with it, push through it. Like what would be your advice? What would be your advice to guys who are like getting into racing, but almost kind of sometimes lose the love for it because of the times that are difficult? Does that make sense? Is the one thing you could say to them to be like, see it this way? I think for me, every time when I'm struggling, I just maybe finish a practice run and I'm like, I don't have fun or it's not working. My goal for the next run is I just go up and have fun. Yeah. Like maybe I do a shroud in that turn. Maybe I do, I don't do any big whips or stuff like this. Maybe I do something funny in the next jump. Thumbs yeah. up for the photographs and some areas. Yeah. This which like gets you up into like a, another mental, mental yeah. game. And I think if a happy race is a fast race. So that's it. That's the, the key for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the hardest things to, to be able to do. And as I say, you've clearly been through it. It's to get through the times that are hard and come out of them the other side, still enjoying it, still loving it, and still wanting to chase that ultimate goal. Because ultimately, as, as an elite level racing, you have a fair few disappointments and you just have to go, right, well, that's that one done. Let's let's push on. And you've clearly done that, come out the other side as, as one of the world's best. So it's going to be interesting for people to, people to hear that. So yeah. nice one. It's cool. So after that season, after 2022, you've broken through, you've become a podium guy was there any point during the off season where you kind of wondered because i remember you went on a big holiday that's why we couldn't get this done you were aware was there any point when you came back and you thought can i repeat it was it a worry was it a hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i think that that was the i was never that nervous in my life before really like pretty much when i when i when the season stopped i was like it's over now now it's like the longest off season ever yeah can I do this again next season? Like I need to, I need to remember everything what I did before I do something wrong next year. Maybe yeah. if I just change the smallest thing, if I eat something different or whatever, I was thinking <laughs> about everything. I, I was stressing myself pretty bad in the winter. Um, I don't remember where did we go on the beginning of the season. There was, I think it was um, the Red Bull camp in in Dubby. Yeah. We did some timing on El Hippo and I was battling pretty hard with Laurie and I knew he was timing there like a couple of weeks before already. And I think I was just point three off him or something. Yeah. And I definitely did way less laps and everything. And I think I, I smoked Charlie a little bit. So yeah, for me that day, it was like, okay, it's still there. And but still going to Lenzara and a thing I remember there. First practice run, I stopped in the first off cam with a super techie one. Yeah. And I had to stop and had to cal calm myself down because my breathing was totally off. I was just standing there and like shaking and couldn't breathe normally because I was so nervous. People watching me are they like thinking about me different because of last year. And yeah. my whole mental game was a bit different. But then I won qualities and everything was yeah. sick again. <laughs> Mate, it's so, it's so nice to hear you say that because I went to Lens Island after one of the best pre-seasons I'd ever had, but having two years of injury before that and then got to Lens Island, got on track and just my, my head just melted. Felt exactly yeah. the same as you. I felt fine on my bike, but every time I was like not riding, I was just nervous and, and yeah, it's interesting to hear someone at your level saying the same thing. I was also nervous on the bike. There was just people standing next to the track. I was so nervous. Yeah. 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 Sure. It was pretty bad. Yeah. I was happy when that day was over. Can I just ask, like, given the team that you're on, yeah, you've got Rachel and G there who have been through all this, yeah, numerous times before. Do you speak to them about any of this? Um, guess a little bit, not too much. Have they G been through G this though? Like, that's, that's the thing. I don't feel, I don't feel like G was ever through something like this. Think about their backgrounds. They've been. And so like 15 years old, 16 years or whatever, like they've been like the creme de la creme of the sport, whereas Andy's actually yeah. Hey George. Yeah, but they've come back from, they've come back from big injuries, haven't they? And, you know, they, suppose, must, have yeah, wondered, they must have wondered, yeah. like, am I going to be as good as I was? You know, like, especially I Rachel. guess Rachel, Rachel would have been through that this year, of course. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. I think, I think Rachel's for sure through stuff like this, but 
I never really talk to her about stuff like this because I feel like, I don't know, I don't want to bother her and stuff like this. <laughs> He's still a legend to me. She's still a legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I don't want to be like that little Austrian, like asking every little question. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. And she, she, she to me seems like an animal. Like he's oh, insane. You're not alone there, mate. What I is this guy ever? Um, yeah. Alien. Yeah, it must be. <laughs> Alien. Unbelievable. Okay. So 2023 then, as you just said, round one lens are hide. You won qualies second in semis and we're all standing at the bottom waiting for you to come down. Crashed at the top. Um, you were on pace. Obviously that was reassuring. How did you feel at, you know, the weekend when, like, obviously feelings afterwards, talk us through it. Um, yeah, I think lens either was a bit too, too high. Okay. Because I came into the season and my main goal was to win a, win a world cup. Yeah. But consistent, like don't be first and then 60th and stuff like this. Um, so I came into the season and my goal was actually just to do a top 10, just be consistent. And then I won qualities and I think my mind just changed. I was like, I'm having oh, this shit. I can win my world cup now. It yeah. could be now. So like, I got second in semis and I lost my chain on the last section. So I, would have been first, would have, should have, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I knew, okay, the, the pace is still on. I can go faster. And then I started in, in the final run. I was so aggressive out of this arcade. I think the first section I rode like never before. Then the left corner, I had the exit speed of my life. <laughs> I doubled something, which I still don't know what I doubled there. Like I just pulled up and like doubled over a hill and I was like, how? How did I gain all that speed? And next second, I know my front wheel was gone and I just exploded like yeah, huge crash. I crashed from the top of that off camera down to all the, the left turn. That's why I stopped like crashing. I was a gnarly one. And yeah, this one was over. I did my knee, in, my knee a little bit, Ref. like a soft tissue or you call it. I saw the picture. I went and looked yeah. yesterday. I was looking through your Instagram and there's like yeah. a picture of it. It's just like one knee's like twice the size of the other knee. But that was after Leo going in. Was that one Leo going? That was after Leo again because I crashed and slapped me. But yeah, my knee started to make problems there for pretty much the whole season. Right. Started to be good two weeks ago. Wow. So yeah, wasn't the best. How much was being protected through the semis kind of helping you? Was that reassuring? Huge. Oh, yeah. Like Charlie wasn't protected for semis, I think, for all season. Yeah. And every time we talked about something... I was like, fuck, I don't want to be in his shoes. Because yeah. if I tire or something, it's so shit. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think we actually voted for the whole protection stuff last year. And I was surprised how many people wanted protection because it's, it's not really fair. Yeah. I guess like superstars like Bruni and everybody that should be in the main show because of the viewers. But on the other side, it's not fair. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference if uh, number 57 makes it to the final or Bruni. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. For me, look at, I think it would be sick. No protection rule at all. That's it. Yeah. I agree with you. Cause I think like if you out of 60 riders say the chances of the, there's so many superstars now, you know, there's a top 10 of them. The chances of them all not making it and there being no story, but then it's an even bigger story that none of the superstars have made it. Almost. Yeah. You know, there's only know? ever one, two or three. There's never yeah. more. Rarely more than three that don't get in, and and look at the get and Vish story from Montserrat. Like, yeah, that's way fucking cooler than oh, like one again. Like, I, I love like I'm one of his biggest yeah. fans, but still, no, for sure, he'll get through most, if not all, the time. Whereas, yeah, so I totally agree. I think we we maybe need more races for no protection. That's still the only thing where yeah. I'm like, okay, I understand because like next year seven World Cups, if you miss one, yeah, all of this, yeah, yeah, okay, really gone. But mm. it is a bit of. It makes sense for the overall. Yeah. Yeah. So on to the big one then. Uh, round two was Leo Gang, uh, 11th in qualifying, ninth in the semi, and then boom, only riders to go under three minutes. You win your home World Cup. Talk us through it. <laughs> <laughs> the gnarliest weekend of my life. Um, yeah. Going there from Lenzada, I knew the, the pace is good. Um, yeah. And he was making a bit of problem. I was a bit worried about this. Luckily, we had a physio there. Because Rachel wanted a physio, not really done as a physio. And Wayne was a big help, definitely like taping and like just yeah, really? telling me what to do. And body was, yeah, was pretty much good for racing. And the mental side was the, the other thing, actually. Just every second person I met there, you gotta win this week, you gotta win this week, you need to win this week. I will get your jersey when you win this race. Like everybody, <laughs> I was 
nearly getting angry because I thought, I want to like destroy it because it's so much pressure on me. Yeah. But I think that's what I realized the last two years. The more pressure is on me, the better I get nearly. Yeah. So that we can show it again. There's a lot of pressure on me. It like brings out the best in me. And, um, what was it? Quali? Is it rained? I think it was like the second fastest guy who was in the, in the Nali storm, like after the Nali storm. Yeah. Oh, quali was already sick. And then semis, I played a bit of a safe, um, what do you call it? The safer game. Just like don't show everything and keep the aggression for final run because that's what I think destroyed it in Lenza. I was too, too hyped up too early. And then I maybe wasn't too, wasn't focused enough. Like I said, I did a double. I don't remember. Yeah. Like I was only there anymore. And then when we went up to finals run, I remember the gondola. I like, near it today. It's going to be a sick day. It's just. The feeling, the warm up, everything, jokes with Ben on the Stargate. And I remember, like, I think the last thing I said to him was, like, I want this shit so bad and went to the Stargate and the crowd on the bottom, everything. Like, it gives me goosebumps now. It's insane. So cool. Still can't believe it. Across the line, and I knew this is going to be a podium. So for me, it was already, this is so sick. Doing another podium at home, like last year. And whole family there, like a little fan group and stuff like this. And then last three guys up there, still first, Loic behind me, and then Finn does a mistake in the last section. And yeah, just everything getting real was pretty gnarly, pretty emotional. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. Um, I think you said you made a couple of mistakes in the top stump section. At any point during the run, did you did you think, fuck, I've, I've, I've blown this? Or were you just, were you there? Oh, yeah, or down? yeah um, I think I did on the entrance, or I think I know it exactly. Um, <laughs> the entrance of the first dump section, I did a little mistake there, nearly crashed actually. And then I was like, come on, focus, focus. And I was already thinking about the exit onto the motorway because this is like the most important corner yep. or section of the whole track. And Brownie, our team manager, sent, um, Ben, my mechanic, a message. You need to pedal onto the motorway. That like seems to be the fast way to do it. And I was already thinking about pedaling. And then I messed up the, the last stump, was too far left and like loose gravel, nearly missed the jump, case the jump. And then that second, I just thought, oh my God, Brownie is watching right now. He was, <laughs> oh my God, he did. He fucked you up so bad. <laughs> and I think from there on, I was just like, okay, now you need to, no mistake anymore. Yeah, it's everything. Now yeah. is not a show time. Yeah. And from there on, I think I did no mistake at all. Especially last section, I, I never rode my bike like this. Like the last section, I railed everything perfectly. Yeah. And coming into the finish, yeah. Insane. Yeah, so, I bet. I just want to ask you, like, you know, like when you've, when you've done that bottom bit, you've ridden it, that's the best you've ever ridden your bike, you know, and you cross the line and you're like, oh, wicked, that's a podium run. Did you then think, uh, remember that you fucked up those, mis that stump section and go, oh, I'm probably not going to win? Or yeah, that, that's why I thought it's not going to, it's not going to be enough for the win. Yeah. So I, I, I think I, I, I like, I thought I know this is not going to be enough, yeah. but yeah, I think the trick was so fast and so loose. So everybody's doing mistakes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, luckily that happened. Yeah. So, I mean, the journey from that you've described there for us from working as a car mechanic and trying to race and not qualifying at world cups to winning your home world cup like does the do you think the journey's made it even sweeter everything you've been through 100 percent. yeah 100 i i didn't want I, I would not like to change anything yeah yeah i think about it i of course it's sick like jackson is doing right now just coming to the leads like crushing it and everything but i think it's just a different story and yeah i like it how it is yeah mark yeah. now congratulations it's thank you very much to talk yeah, about it so cool so Sixth in Val Sol, and then on to Fort William for Worlds. That mistake in the woods, was it worth 0.6? Um, I think this one wasn't too bad. I messed up the exit afterwards again as well, which nearly was a bit worse, I think. You couldn't really see it on the camera. Right, There okay. was two mistakes in there, but yeah, I think it would have been it, but would have, should have, so Charlie is the best rider in yeah. sections like this, so... I yeah, played to him and losing to him is the best, yeah. best shit ever. <laughs> and I, I, you seeded second, which I think you thought was a bit of a surprise. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was proper surprised. Why? Because for William, I don't know why, but I hated that place. <laughs> really. <laughs> I, 
every time I went up there, I just struggled or crashed. That's why I broke my collarbone, for example. And I just never had like a great time. And I think we, we did a good change on the bike this year, which we have a bit more grip than the season before. And yeah, just everything, the whole bike team like, made it possible. I, the number of clips we've got, we've not. I don't think we've got any clips of anybody talking about any other tracks and saying, you know, how much they hate them. But we've got Tebow talking about Fort William. Um, we've got Dak talking about Fort William, and they all just say, I fucking hate it. I fucking hated yeah. it. But so, I don't hate it anymore. No, because really, now you've had I, a good run. The, 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 change, the changes they did was good, I think. Yeah. It just look. added a bit of bit, bit of, or some flow because yeah. before, I don't know. If the bike was awful, just, I don't know, something was awful and you, the whole track was just a struggle. It yeah. wasn't fun at all. And now you have a bit of some fun sections in there, which yeah. make it, yeah, way better. So really random stat that I noticed when I was writing this episode, and it just shows how consistent you guys are. So your speed trap in quali there was 63.6, 63.60. And your race was identical, 63.60. So you got second. Laurie's was 61.02 in quality and 61.02 in the race as well. And he got no third. Way. So it, it's just incredible how consistent you guys are. Tell us a bit about that moment when you crossed the line. The crowd went, ooh. You knew you hadn't, you know, it wasn't enough. But then you looked round and you saw Charlie in the hot seat. Yeah, I was like the first, first second, of course, I was angry because I came into the line. I already looked up uh, on the last jump and I saw red and I was like, yeah, it will be red probably afterwards again. And I look back second and then just look up a little bit to see who it is. And then it's Charlie Head. <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe it. And oh, I, I mean, I can't believe it because he, is one of the best riders ever. I, yeah. Every time I go out riding with him, he's insane. And yeah, but it, anyway, that moment was, yeah, insane. And then we stayed out there for one and two for Arthur and Bikes, like the smallest bike company in the circuit, nearly. It's yeah. pretty sick. And just to see all the emotions, like all everybody from the HQ, the hard work they put in. And yeah, just seeing Lloydy cry. <laughs> best <laughs> thing ever. Nice. So, when when I was up there, I spoke to you and you said, yeah, you can't live with Charlie through that middle section. Oh, yeah. There was World Champs third run in practice. I asked Charlie if I can follow him and I already knew it would be a hard time. Yeah. I followed him. I have it on GoPro. I think I need to post this. You do, because um, he talked about this on the podcast. Yeah. When he, they did. Told us. Yeah, not, nothing to do with you. He said that he did his third run and he was like, fuck, I'm good to go. He <laughs> said, I've never yeah. ridden like this before. I'm good to go. So to hear it, to hear that you were behind him and you have GoPro footage and that, please get it online. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think yeah. I got it. I think I just yeah. got the top section because I didn't follow him afterwards, but I think I got it somewhere. But yeah. anyway, I followed him from Stargate to Tower 13, how it's called. Yeah. And I was, it was the feeling like being on a race run. Yeah. I was like, I, I want to stop, but I, I don't <laughs> want to stop. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I want to hang on him and just try to follow him. And we stopped and I was just shouting at him, this is a fucking race, man, what's going on? <laughs> and we, we both said, okay, we need to calm down. I think the speed is really good. We should not overdo it now. Just like keep the speed, but don't, don't overdo it. Yeah. And that's and the, the teammates, right? If Charlie had yeah. flown, nobody to say, dude, like we are fucking flying. He might have kept going or you might have kept pushing and injuries, crashes. So having each other there to bounce off, it just shows the importance of that. Yeah. And we did so much work together on that weekend. We compared our GoPros like every day and just watched lines till, I don't know how, how late it was. And yeah, it all paid off. So yeah, the my- next question is, you two make a great team. Why is it working so well? Um, I think we're quite similar. Charlie is just one of the nicest guys I know. Yeah. Um, there's never like, if we travel somewhere like a week off, we go riding together. It's like, let's do this. Okay, let's do this. It's never like, nah, I don't want to do this. We go to the gym together, which is a great time. We into the same stuff like trials, bikes, cars, and yeah, just. Always a chill time with him. Yeah, nice. It's really good. So I hope I hope he said the same. <laughs> well, you didn't. Well, mention, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I need to listen to it. 
<laughs> yeah, he said he, you were missing. He said he said he thought you were missing him in the second half of the oh, season. Yeah. yeah, I was definitely missing him in uh, America. Yeah, because yeah, you told me, didn't you? Pardon? You told me in Montenegro, you were like, "Fuck, I missed." Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was weird because there was like nobody like, we can talk to. I started to talk to Dom to our junior a bit more, which okay. I think helped helped him. He did really well at the last two races, but there was something was missing. Just like talking about lines, like normally really? it's like. Dude, I found a sick inside line there. Let's do this one. I found this one. Like we, we just like share everything with each other. And yeah, the fair was was losing that a bit. Well, like not losing, missing. Sorry. It's nice you guys have got that relationship and it's functional because it is. Maybe you'll agree with this, but it is difficult when you're both professionals and you're competing against each other to start sharing that information and it never get to a point where somebody's trying to one up the other. Mm. It is yeah. really hard to do that. Me and me and Dan have been teammates for four years, and sometimes before you know it, in a conversation, someone's trying to say they were better than the other one through there. And yeah, if it's it's like tensions can get high. So it's it's nice that you guys have got that relationship at World Championships, and then you both come first and second. It just shows that it's like super functional. And yeah. without Charlie, I would have never been on the podium that weekend. So yeah. Exactly. That's really I think cool. we always like work each other, work with each other and it helps each other. And you see it with some other riders sometimes. They give Gero and Taprela in their best times. Yeah. You could always see like they work work with each other. Yeah. And I think Win and Dakota Norton sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you can yeah, see it. Helps about that. It definitely helps. Definitely. Should not should not say it. <laughs> It's, it's kind of the opposite, though, of what has been traditional in downhill mountain biking. And, and well, motorsports, if you want to be first, you've got to be, beat your teammate. Yeah. You, yeah. That was the, yeah. the old school approach, wasn't it? But maybe it, I think it's a bit bit of what kind of guy you are, maybe. I think yeah. me and Charlie, we both are pretty easy guys. We're not like, yeah. I would not say someone is like egoistic or something. Yeah. That's like pretty easy. Or we don't think like that. Charlie is not think like he's just shit now because he is the world champ. Yeah. Like in other teams, you can see someone who's doing sick results and then he, he's not saying hi anymore and stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, moving on. So Andorra, unlucky with the weather and crashed out after seeding in eighth. Ludenville, fourth in quali, 16th in semis, 15th in the finals. Leger, big mistake in quali, sixth in semi, but second in the final, as we've talked about earlier. Um, behind Benoit. Would you say that's another race this year where you've been, I wouldn't say happy to be second, but like you were like, well, you know, I'll take that, you know, the world champs yeah. and Leger. Or were you, were you like, fuck, I didn't win? For sure. Um, I think I was really stoked in Leger anyway because it was going pretty shit before. Yeah. It's crazy. I came into Leger and my mental game was pretty, pretty broke because Andorra I did a ligament in my ankle and then Ludenville was just, I thought, okay, maybe the, that's a big issue for riding and I don't know how, how the season will go, blah, blah, blah. But another crash in Leger, which I didn't know why it happened and I really struggled there. And then coming out in finals, swinging was just sick. So, really nice. Yeah, People- seeing Benoit winning, I remember I talked to him on Trekwalk and I just said, it, enjoy it tomorrow, home crowd, it will be so sick. Yeah. And he did, he did it and yeah. I think to see someone win like Charlie and Benoit, it just reminds me to my to my own, like my own in Leo gang. Yeah. You know, like he must be feeling so good right now. Like this is way better if I would win. So yes. Yeah. This is like the best way I could be. It's interesting actually, just off the top of my head now, like thinking about the level of the sport and how many of you guys are in that top block. You've got you winning on home soil, you've got Charlie winning world champs on home soil, Loic winning Ludenville home soil. Jackson, Montserrat, home soil, and then Benoit. Y- you've got to wonder if you guys are all so fucking good, but so similar that it's that little thing that just makes the difference in that that riding. I don't know if there's any more. Have I missed any more where it's home soil wins? No, she was American Irish. Uh, yeah. Who won in Andorra? Well, I had T-Bug. Uh, the Prelo, yeah. It's also nearly a home win, I would say. Um, so yeah, interesting, interesting. I mean, your run in Leger was, was an awesome run. When you came down and you hit Loic out of the hot seat, did you think, oh, I think I've done this? What, what did you think when you came through the line? I was not happy when I crossed the line because I thought I did shit. Okay. <laughs> I did so many, mi- I wish I would ever go promote that run. Okay. Like the top section you couldn't see on TV, I was like two meters off my line sometimes. Okay. I was wow. miles away of what I wanted to do. Yeah. 
I remember just before the first, before the lake on the top, I was pretty close to stop, to stop going fast and just do it safe because I was making so many mistakes and being offline, nearly crashed once. I thought this is just dangerous to leave it. And then next call, I got sick again. I'm like, ah, I keep pushing it's sick. And then I did another couple of mistakes. It was the loosest run of my life pretty much. Yeah. Okay. And I crossed the line and I just went, oh my God, this was so wild. It must be miles away. Looked over to Bruni and he's like, give me a thumbs up. Like, wait. <laughs> He's not looking at me. <laughs> no, no. Like, <laughs> I just went to the league and well, I lost it. I was celebrating hard. So was, I watched. That was sick. I watched this the other day, and he gives you uh, like a little royal royal clap, yeah. doesn't he? And then a, th- a begrudging thumbs up, kind of. Yeah, I, fl- I lost the smoke, Bruni. <laughs> <laughs> if I yeah. can say that, I watch you guys like Super Bruni and like all the the top stars in our sport. If you smoke one of them, like me, nah, it's just the yeah. sickest feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Nice. So you finished the season, a couple of eights since no shoe and down, fifth in the overall, uh, but no overall podium. Were you pissed about that? Yeah, yeah. Luckily, there was nobody close to me. It would have been a headbutt for someone, I think. <laughs> I was I was so I was so angry. I had to walk off. I think it's, it's not nice what they did to us that day because I think you train for something and you, in snowshoe, I pretty much knew I was going to be in the top five. Yeah, I could go up to second if I do like a, if a miracle happens. But for me, it was like, okay, six or five again. And when I got kicked off the daily podium in Montserrat, I was still happy because I knew, okay, I got to go on the podium for the season, for the overall podium. And then Lloydy comes up to me, ah, there's no overall podium for you, only top three. And I was like, dude, this is, this is not nice at all. Like, See, I, this, I didn't know about this until I've read the script. No, so me and me and Finn were pretty pretty angry, I think. So they they put no press or no warning out about this to any of the teams. They just uh, ch- maybe maybe there was the one for the week and then that little what do you call it event map or something. But before we didn't know anything. Wow, I just heard it then. It's five podium sport, isn't it? That, that's uh, what we have. You yeah, know, you can't I mean, just go to three at the end. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, you. you you have five guys on the podium for the for the day, and then yeah. three for the oval. If it would be the other way around, it would make more sense to me. But yeah, maybe I'm thinking about like this because it affects me. But yeah, if I'd known it before, I would be all good with it. But yeah, or maybe I would have gone faster because I would have been <laughs> more aggressive for top three. You know, it's like you never really know. It should be communicators, not on the yeah, day. Definitely. Crazy. Oh, yeah, luckily no hit, but for someone. Yeah, <laughs> they got lucky. <laughs> um, sticking with the controversial stuff, what are your thoughts on the semi-final and the other changes we've had this year? Semi-final being, I guess, the main change. Um, on the beginning, I was a big fan because I thought more racing. I love racing. Racing sick. Um, but then my mind changed after, I don't know when it was, maybe after Leo actually, um, because... It's just not that interesting, I would say. Yeah. I think you guys talked about it before on a, on a podcast. Just you see the same thing again. Just you watch semis and then you see the same thing again, which is finals. But you already know, okay, this guy is going to be fast. This guy is going to be fast. It's not going to be a miracle. Yeah. Sometimes maybe, but you already know, okay, these five boy, boys going to be winning probably. Yeah. Okay. So I think what? they should get rid of it. And it's yeah. a top 30 final anyway. I think. I mean, especially like for riders like you, you qualified most, I guess. Yes, six out of eight. Yeah. yeah. And then you did like a couple top 40s, I think. No? Yeah. Yeah. As I, does it make a big difference for you if you would qualify 34th and then you already out or you go to semis and then do a 34th? Does it make a difference really? It, it does in the sense this year they showed us on YouTube. So. Yeah, true. That's a Bill thing. racing, showing off our sponsors. So yeah, I mean, for me, it was almost a saving grace, I guess, this year that the semis, the, if they'd left the final th- as 60, great. But when the final became 30, if they'd got rid of the semis, I think I would have retired. If, if there wasn't a 60 semi, I would have gone, well, the last couple of years shows that I'm probably not going to make any 30s. And I didn't. Um, and or I was on pace for that, but it didn't end up happening. But yeah, I mean, I think the main thing on that subject is. Go, I, th- I agree with going to a 30 final if that's what they're moving the World Cups towards, but they need to put, something needs to happen with the development series with IXSs, 
those things need to start being televised. They need to start getting more attention because like I'm 34 now, my career's moving in a different direction, but there are a lot of guys, my level who were in their early twenties. I mean, think about yourself when you were in your early yeah, yeah. top 30 finals wasn't oh, I will, I will be gone. I will be coming in right now. And sure. look, yeah, but and look at the career you've had. You're now one of our top riders that we all love watching race. Yeah, like one of my personal favorites to see you around and see you compete in. Love your attitude and seeing the way you kind of are at the events. We would have missed that. So oh, for sure, like also Benoit and Dexter exactly. and guys like us. So, so what they're doing, I agree with in the sense of they're making the sport more professional, but they can't just do it because nah, they, they need so to build it up people, like a second series. Yeah. Sure, yeah. somewhere to go and develop so that then they can develop and, and move on into the next one. So, so yeah, I think I don't agree with semis. I think it needs to go, but the, they need to improve the, like the system building towards that. Uh, what, I what, think what this is already be, happening. I think there's already something going on, but yeah, I think this should happen before. Yeah. Like 100%. you what can't do, you, do it after about, because that's yeah. two years, which will be really yeah. bad for privateers. Yeah, hundred percent. What do you think about the change they've done next year with reducing the practice time on finals day? Have you seen this? That that oh, hour, I don't know about that. That hour block we were given before semis to do two runs. Now they only have to give us thirty minutes. What do you think about that? Are you going to be happy with just one run in the morning, or or you um, can? I think I'm happy with that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's okay. I mean, it definitely changed a bit how much lines you can change before yep. finals. Or like yes. you go for track walk after qualities, yeah, probably can't change many lines again because yeah, yeah. yeah, there's not much time. But I think it's maybe good having too much time in the morning is not good for me nearly. Yeah, okay, because I'm overthinking it nearly. Like, yeah, you kind push of back ready again, push back again, push yeah. back again, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah, but if it's like only thirty minutes, like you have one run, yeah, push back two or three sections, that's it. Yeah, it's interesting it's you say that. It's almost the opposite to someone like Minar, who you, you'll see on that last session. Like he's up there most of the time. He's usually the last guy off the hill, like doing loads. Yeah. So then it's interesting to hear your strategy of, yeah, I'm good to go. Just swallow up and, and do the thing. So cool. I mean, it, and it's the same for everybody. So it's definitely is, doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Nice. I think, but yeah, same is, same is the biggest thing for me. Yeah. Any thoughts on the venues for 2024? Um, definitely not enough. That's number one. Yeah. Uh, Poland could be interesting. Like I know some Polish guys and they said there's no trek really. Oh, yeah. But you're that's the like, second that's person two, to tell us that. Two yes. months ago. So I don't know. You, you, you can build a, a good trek pretty fast, but in Poland, I don't know. So let's see. It could be really good. It could be pretty bad. Like Lildenville wasn't, wasn't ready this year. I hope nothing like this happens again. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. otherwise Fort William first, first round is like a classic. Lear gang, big track now, so I'm stoked. Uh, what's the next one? Val de Sol. Val de Sol, one of my favorite tracks of all time. Yeah. Is it Lecher? Is the next one, isn't it? Leger is it there? Uh, Ludenville. Right. One thing I did want to ask about is Leger is spread over two weekends. Same as this year. It's yeah, it? down, it's XC downhill Endura. So X downhill's on the first weekend, is it? That's what they did this year. I assume it's the same this time. I, I haven't seen a breakdown for next yeah, year. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure right now. I have it on my phone somewhere. Um, what's the, the last one is Montenegro again, which is weird again. So late in the season, yeah. there's like seven races and then we need to race till October. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. The huge break in the middle is crazy. Like it's the Olympics in it though. Well, they, yeah. they can't, they can't do any XC. I yeah. think there, there would be a bit more space on the beginning or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But I think it's just weird to have not many races and race that long. Yeah. yeah. So one last thing I wanted to ask you about. I think I saw somewhere that when you're training, you sometimes do runs where you only use your front brake. Is that true? And if so, tell us a bit about why you do that. Yeah, that's why I said that I wanted to keep the secret, actually. <laughs> Doesn't it help? It helps. Big time, I think. Yeah. Um, but it just shows how much you can use your front brake. And to me, if you don't use a rear brake too much you don't lock up your suspension too much and the front brake just slows you down way more so yeah. you can brake later it's crazy i can just tell everybody try it you will be amazed how fast you go with only front brake it's okay. crazy you start to lock up the front brake and stuff like this it's pretty gnarly <laughs> but don't don't please don't, don't put your rear brake off just put it like somewhere like you don't touch it all the time so if there is an emergency 
breaking you need it you can do it <laughs> i can see jack's mind processing that and like thinking right like, oh, now i'm telling time. the uk writer stuff like this. that's yeah, not yeah. good they're already way too good anyway <laughs> great stuff so when does the training start for 2024 uh right now i've just started today started today right um, yeah and what and what's the goal for 2024 now um there's no goal set yet but i think Trying to repeat repeat something like this, what happened this year, yeah. and just make it more consistent. And if it's more com- consistent, I'm maybe part of um, being in the fight for the whole world. So, yeah. And taking the stripes of Charlie, of course. <laughs> Andorra? What do you reckon? Um, yeah, I mean, this year was, we was it qualities? I don't remember. I had a mechanical in, in semis or qualities. Oh, there was no there was no semis. There was no semis. Qualities had a mechanical. I was second till there. Yeah. I nearly went off trick and like had a massive wobble. That was eighth. And then in finals, I had a really good run as well. Well, you came down uh, the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like third right in the rain or something like this. So I think I got to figure it out now because I didn't like it before the new track. So I'm stoked for, for next year. Well, thanks for making the time to come on the show. Congratulations on another amazing season. I hope you can take it up one more level next year and maybe do the overall. That would be so cool to see. Good luck next season. Thank you very much. Stoked to to be here. Yeah, man, thanks for coming on. It was really cool to hear your story. Like, obviously, I've been very aware of you since you joined the Athens and started doing well, but there's a lot of background there that I wasn't aware of and I'm sure a lot of listeners wouldn't have heard. And, you know, it's all well and good hearing the stories of the guys who've had everything on the way up, but to hear your story and now see your success is is fucking cool man congratulations thank you thank you so much cheers that's all we've got time for in this episode thanks to the wonderful sponsors of the show hope technology jtech suspension revolution bike park ride southern spain schwalb and single track world.com if you're enjoying the podcast i'm sure you know what to do by now please subscribe so you don't miss an episode and if you've got a second please drop us a review alternatively please give us a follow on instagram at making up the numbers racing or facebook.com slash making up the numbers Thanks for listening. We'll be back very soon. This has been the Mammoth Production for Making Up the Numbers.